so good to see you guys. Let's see. Dylan, can I sit over here by you and Logan? Both these, I'm sorry. Well, good morning. It's so good to see you guys today. You guys want to come up here? There's plenty of room here. Graham, let me move that back here. And we've got room for everybody. Well, today we're entering the second week of Advent and we are preparing our hearts for Christmas. So I have a question for you this morning. What does a church use banners for? Christmas, that's right. Do you see any banners about Christmas anywhere hanging in the sanctuary? Samuel, right there? Let's see. Yeah, and Je that's right. And baby Jesus, and let's see what the ones we have of Advent hanging up back. We have hope, we have peace, we have joy and love. And today we lit the second candle on our Advent wreath, the candle of peace for Jesus, our Prince of Peace. Well, I brought a banner to show you this morning. It's a big, beautiful banner. It says the Prince of Peace for Jesus. Do you know, to, back in Jesus' day, when a king came to visit to a community, people per preceded him with banners, making an announcement saying that the king was coming to get ready and prepare their way for their king. Well, in Mark, it tells us that John the Baptist did that for Jesus. You might say that John himself was a church banner because he was out in the wilderness preparing people for Jesus' coming. And as we prepare to celebrate Jesus and celebrate the birth of our Savior, the banners in our church not only remind us to celebrate the birth, but to also prepare our hearts and our lives when Jesus comes again. So how do you think we can do that? Like, what would we do to prepare our lives for Jesus' return? How could we live our life? What are some of the things we could do? Any ideas, girls? Who do we look to to ask for forgiveness of our sins? Yes, right. What else could we do? Do you think that maybe we could uh, live our lives in a way that would make Jesus proud to call us his children? Yeah, that's right. What about being kind and loving towards others? Do you think we could do that? Yeah. And then what about uh, being like John, like helping others prepare for Jesus' return? So what do you say our lives become banners proclaiming the good news of our Savior? Do you think we could do that? Can our lives be banners for Jesus? Can I hear a big yes? Yes! All right. Well, this morning I've got some puzzles and some coloring pages for you to take with you when you go to Kids Church, talking about our scripture, teaching us to prepare the way for our Lord. Can we do that? Can you prepare your heart this Christmas for Jesus? Oh, yes. Awesome. Baby Jesus, you sure are a sweet little girl. I'm so glad you're here today. All right. Would y'all have praying hands and pray with me? All right. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. We look forward. We look forward. To celebrating your birth. To celebrating your birth. Help us. Help us. To prepare. To prepare. By sharing your love. And your grace with others. We love you. Amen. Are y'all ready? Yay, Jesus! Good morning. Today's scripture is from the New Testament book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 34. These verses contain the proclamation of John the Baptist. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem 
were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Miss Helen. My friends, won't you pray with me? Holy God, hear our prayer. That the word that is spoken and the word that is heard this day may be for us, by the power and inspiration of your Holy Spirit, the Word of God. Amen. In our lesson this morning, we find a character that we are quite familiar with, many of us, and that is John the Baptist. Um, I told John the other day, I said, it seems like we talk about John the Baptist all the time. But he's kind of important in the drama of our faith, is he not? And so we kind of have to talk about him all the time, and at least during this season of Advent. And so here we are again today with this scripture from Mark. I've preached this text many times, and yet I'm always fascinated, and I think newly so, at what an oddball he was. Right? I mean, let's just call it what it is. He really was kind of an oddball. I mean, who walks around with camel hair, right? Eating locusts and wild honey. And John and I were talking in the office this morning. Does that make him a vegetarian? I know there are much more important things that we should be talking about on Sunday morning, but anyway. To say he was a bit eccentric might be an understatement, right? He was a little bit different. Now, somebody at first service said to me, I don't think they're here right now. They said to me, you know, Ellen, he had to be different because otherwise no one would have noticed him. And that's true. That's really true. I mean, he would have blended in with everyone else if he hadn't run around with camel hair and eaten locusts and drinking wild honey and kind of different, right? We don't see people like that around here very often. He had an odd physical presence, and his demeanor was strange. And so people that encountered him, and, and probably if we encountered him today, we'd have to ask ourselves the question, is he mentally stable, right? Because he was just so out of the box, as the kids said a while ago, so out of the box, so different from anything the people had ever encountered. And because of that, many people just kind of blew his message off. They disregarded him altogether. They didn't take him seriously at all. Now, if you want to go to Luke chapter 7 this afternoon and, and read this story in a little more detail, you can do that. You know, Mark is famous for just cutting to the chase, right? He just tells you exactly what happened, and he does it in a very quick fashion. But in Luke chapter 7, you can read a little bit more and have a little bit more detail. But what I want you to hear me say this morning is, don't disregard the message because he's weird, Right? Many people disregarded the message because he was different. He was outside the box. He was something no one had ever encountered before. And so they did disregard him. And he was intimidating. He came across kind of intense. But brothers and sisters, don't just blow off his message because it's critical. He is the one God chose to bring to us the powerful message of the coming of Jesus. And so that's kind of important, wouldn't you say? So we have to pay attention to this message. And in our story and in Advent, we read all of these stories, these warm, fuzzy stories of the manger scene, right? And how pretty it is and, and how nice it must have been that night and how peaceful. And you see those on Christmas cards, those scenes of the manger. And you see those warm, fuzzy things in Hallmark stores, right? And then you go, where does John fit into that? Right? Because he is out of the box. He's different. But he is the unlikely servant that God chose. He's the one that God chose to prepare the way. To be the messenger, the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Now there was already a connection between Jesus and John. And that connection came through Elizabeth and Mary. Elizabeth was Mary's older cousin. Mary was probably only about 13 years old when she gave birth to Jesus. But Elizabeth, on the other hand was more of a grandmother type figure. She was living in what many of us would call our golden years. 
okay? And yet she had not given birth to a child. And God chose her to bring John into the world as the one to prepare our hearts, to prepare us to receive that message. And we read that prophecy from Isaiah in verse 3 of our lesson this morning. The voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. We talked last week about what it meant to make ready and, and to prepare our hearts and our souls and our spirits for the coming of the Christ child. And today we see this very real tangible figure named John. And he was sent to be the messenger to proclaim this for us. Now John and Jesus were pretty near the same age. They grew up together. They played together as children. But somewhere along the way their lives went very different pathways. It became very, very different John actually had quite a few disciples who gathered to be with him when he taught. And other people seemed to be drawn to him. He was very magnetic, especially those who were impoverished, who had nothing. For some reason, they really could relate to this odd man. On the other hand, the wealthy people sort of stayed away. They weren't real sure what to make of this guy. And so the wealthy people, for the most part, disregarded him as some kind of nut. John's disciples eventually became Jesus' disciples as well. So there's a lot of kinship, there's a lot of connection there. As John taught and as he preached, quite a few people began to think that he was the Messiah, that he was the one they had been waiting on. And they became excited because people had been yearning for that hope. They had been yearning for that one who would bring them a change, who would bring them hope once again. They thought this oddball character might just be him. And so he clarifies this in another book, John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. We read, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. And that's what he wanted people to know. He wanted people to know that he was not the prophet. He was not the one coming. He was not the Messiah. But he was the one who was the voice, preparing the way. Now, aside from the obvious differences, we wonder why in the world were people so drawn to this guy? I mean, what made them listen to his message? Maybe it was the odd factor, right? Maybe he was just different enough that he raised curiosity and people were intrigued, and so they listened to his message. But others thought that he was Elijah the prophet coming back to them. And they were excited about that too. They longed for a prophet. I had somebody tell me this morning, I wish we still had prophets. I said, I think we do. In the wisdom of people that you love and trust when you don't know what to do and you go to those persons. I think God sends those people to us. That's a huge side note, I'm sorry. John might be a different kind of guy, but he understood that God was about to do something amazing through him. And so he chose to fulfill his role and prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, to be the messenger, to be the voice. A banner, as Tracy talked with the kids. That was a great image. Now, what set him apart from the crowd? What made people think that he wasn't quite so odd? One thing I think was that despite the fact that he looked kind of strange, what you saw was what you got, right? He was very upfront. He was very direct. People might not have liked necessarily what he was saying, but they knew that what he said was what he believed. He was a straight shooter, we would say today. Everyone knew that he was passionate about the goodness of God and that God loved us so much that he was going to send this Messiah to be with us. And he was there to help point to this newly coming Messiah. But my friends, he also was not afraid to point out someone's wrongdoing. And that makes us all uncomfortable, doesn't it? We don't like somebody telling us when we're not doing something right. In Luke chapter 3, verse 7, when the judgmental and self-righteous religious leaders gathered with the crowd to hear him teach, he called them out. Now, these are pretty strong words. Listen to this. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That's pretty strong, isn't it? His personality was very strong. And yet he said what he believed. He held people accountable. 
His teaching was uncompromised. He knew what he believed and he knew what his calling was. And he took seriously his task to help prepare the hearts of those who were receiving the Messiah. And he knew time was of the essence. I think it's good for us to hold one another accountable, don't you? Is it always fun? No. Is it always painless? No. But I think John took seriously challenging others about the way they live their life. And I think he challenges us about how we live our lives. And we don't necessarily like being called out on our stuff, do we? One thing I love about the walk to Emmaus is the accountability piece that comes after that event. When you come home from your experience on a weekend, it wasn't just a mountaintop experience. And that was nice and fun, but I'm going to go back to my life now. You go, hopefully, the goal is for you to go to a reunion group. A people of like-minded persons and you gather together and you pray and you hold one another accountable. And I know that's hard for us to do sometimes, but my task sometimes is to hold you accountable. And I hope you're going to hold me accountable. Because I don't want what I say and what I do to conflict one another. Because if they do, my witness is very weak. It's very meaningless. And I think John the Baptist wasn't afraid to call people out on their stuff and to hold them accountable. Growing in our faith can be challenging, right? It can be downright painful when we realize we've made a mistake. Sometimes our long-held beliefs of the way we do things get put to a test, and we don't necessarily like that. Maybe we do things because we think we're doing them for the right reasons, but then when we really ba sit back and we look at what we're doing and why we're doing it, we realize we're doing it for ourselves. We're doing it because it makes us feel good or look good. We're not doing it to help someone else. So I think John the Baptist helps challenge our own ways of thinking about what we do and how we serve. I think he was rejected many times because he called people out. Because he held them accountable. He wanted the crowds to turn their life toward this Messiah that was to come. This one that he was called to proclaim. He makes us accountable to God and he helps us learn that we have to repent of our sins and that we have to turn from the things that we do. We have to set aside our egos and our motives and be pure in our thinking. That's sometimes hard, but if we're going to serve God, that's what we have to do. You see, John the Baptist had the courage to challenge sin wherever he met it, and that's not easy. And I'll give you an example. King Herod seduced his brother's wife. And basically said, you're coming home with me. The religious leaders were outraged. But what did they do? Anybody remember? Nothing. They didn't do anything. The people were outraged. But what did they do? Nothing. They didn't do anything because they were afraid to call him out on that because they knew King Herod. And they knew that he could be brutal, he could be violent when he was provoked. And so they knew, even though they disagreed with his behavior, the best thing they could do was keep their mouth shut. But John the Baptist couldn't do that. Without his own safety, he attacked it head on. And as you know from the story, as the story goes on, he was later arrested and he was killed. Because he stood up for what he believed. Because he challenged somebody on the way they were behaving. So my friends, what does this mean for us? As we are now in the second Sunday of Advent. It's time for us to continue what we started last week. Last week we talked about making ready. Preparing ourselves. Today we're called to be the voice. The voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. My friends, I think we have to kind of take a page out of John's notebook. And realize that we can't win a popularity contest, right? I don't think John the Baptist could have won a popularity contest. But he knew that he could go to sleep at night. That he could look himself in the mirror because he was doing what he knew God was calling him to do. And sometimes that's not easy. And during this Advent season, I want you to know that he's passing the mantle to you. And he's passing the mantle to me. Doesn't mean we need to be rude or judgmental. It means that we are called... To prepare others and prepare ourselves. Better be ready to do it ourselves first. To receive the one who's coming. We are called to be the messenger. We are called to be the one who speaks out. And everything we say may not be particularly pleasing to those around us. And that's okay. 
Many people ask me why I wear this robe. And I wear this robe because I hope it removes Ellen from the conversation. I hope you can see only the messenger and hear the message. You know, and, and I said this a while ago, and John and I have kind of laughed about it this morning, but women are bad about, doesn't she know that's not a good color on her? <laughs> <coughs> that skirt is too short. I mean, right, women, are we kind of that way? Guys, they never notice. <laughs> Guys, I'm not slighting you, but isn't it the truth? You don't care what somebody else is wearing. Although, today, we've had a little team spirit with TCU and A&M and <laughs> Baylor and, you know, had a little of that going on. But for the most part, we don't care. The whole point of me being the messenger is to remove Ellen. It isn't important who I am. What is important is what I say and how I live my life. And hopefully if I have this long thing on, it's kind of warm. It removes the person so that you can hear what I have to say. And I'll wear it a lot. I'll wear it at the graveside even, usually. Even on a hot day. Because I think it's not important that they see Ellen or what Ellen's wearing as much as they see that it's the messenger. The voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. My brothers and sisters, are you willing to be the voice? Are you willing to be the messenger? During this Advent season, we all have a task to prepare the way of the Lord. And I don't know what that looks like for you, but I suspect as I look around and I see some empty seats today that we probably know somebody we can invite to fill those seats. And more importantly, if you look around, I want you to just take a second, look around. We all sit in the same place every week, right? So who usually sits next to you that's not there today? I want you to look, I want you to take note. Who is not here today that you usually see? Okay, this afternoon I want you to call them and say, I missed you. Are you okay? Because people slip between the cracks and we don't intend that, but it happens. And so it's important to invite people as we are the messengers for Christ. But it's also important that we make sure that our loved ones, our friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ know that we care when they're not here. I had an email this week from a couple of this, a member of this church and they're up in years and their health has forced them to move and be near their son. And I grieve the fact that we didn't know that till now they're gone. They have another address established in another community and I never knew that. I would have been at their house talking to them, praying with them before they left, not to change their mind, but to let them know that we care and that we will miss them. And they probably made the right decision. As many of you know, it kind of comes a time in that life where you have to move to be near your children. And that's what they've chosen to do. And I totally understand that. What I grieve is that I didn't have the opportunity to, to pray them through that. And to help them and to tell them that we love them and we're going to miss them. But we pass them on with love and kindness to another congregation. So my brothers and sisters, how will you prepare the way this week? How will you be the messenger and the voice proclaiming the coming of the Christ child? It may be calling the person that's not sitting with you today. It may be inviting someone that you work with who doesn't have a church home and inviting them to come and be with us. I don't know what that looks like for you, but I want you to seriously pray about that. During this season of Advent, this is our time. This is our special time to be the messenger for Jesus Christ. Now, what you say or do may not be real popular, but it will be pleasing to God. I promise you that. Won't you pray with me? Loving God, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for this church family. I thank you for every person who is here and every person who is not here. And I pray, oh God, that you'll be with those who are not here and help them know that they are missed and they are loved. Bless them, oh God, and bring them back to be with us. I thank you, Lord, that you've called us to be messengers of the gospel. And I know that that's not always really easy, but I know that you've called us to it nonetheless. And so, Lord, be with us and equip us. And help us know how to do that in an effective way, in a loving way. Help us to be your disciples. Help us to be your hands and feet. Thank you for that gift. In the name of Jesus Christ, that precious child born in a manger, we pray.